They say that necessity is the mother of invention. And indeed, the famine village came about when owner Pat Doherty needed to break away from the harsh cycle of a migratory worker. Pat's work had taken him to many of the tourist hotspots in Ireland, yet he could not find one that matched the natural beauty of his home. In 1997, he converted his recently abandoned family homestead into the Famine Village, each year adding new exhibits in response to customer feedback. In this way, the Famine Village grew into one of the main tourist attractions in the Northwest. The Famine Village tells the story of a community living on the edge, surviving from the famine times of the 1840s to the present day. Remoteness and isolation made this a harsh place to live, but the same families have lived here for generations. Because this area is so remote, people here were living off the land and off the sea, and they had to make use of whatever they could find. This here is a seaweed called sloak. You boil this and you eat it long on potatoes. If you did not like this one, your mother would tell you tomorrow, go down to the beach tomorrow and pack something you do like. And you can end up with all the different seashells. Again, this is one of them called limpets. People had to make use of whatever they could find. Now, for example, this is a seaweed called slack mara. That's an Irish word. It means the rod from the sea. The mothers took it off from the sea. They made a ring like this from it. They cut off the rough parts, but they hold on to the ring. Now, this is the teeth and ring for the babies. Bother with teeth. The wake house is a favourite among visitors to the famine village. Death, of course, is a serious subject. But you might leave here thinking otherwise after hearing Pat's version of this enduring local tradition. Here in this part of Donegal, when somebody dies, we still sit beside the dead person for two nights and it's called a wake. But how it all began, and it wasn't just here in Ireland, but across the world, a fear was going across the world, a fear of being buried alive. And the reason they sat beside the person, they sat beside the person at the beginning, hoping he could still wake up. So that's why it's called wake. Some of the old tradition still happens here. So when somebody dies, the first thing they still do in some houses, they stop the clock at the actual time the person died. The reason they said for that was, everyone came in to pay their respects. But when they walked in the door, everybody was asking the same question. What time did he die at? So stopping the clock saves you answering the first question. And the rule in some houses here, we never put the clock going again, as a mark of respect to the person who died. <laughs> In the past in Ireland we had a, a lady called a keener and her purpose she makes a certain sound, a certain noise. So what she's trying to do, she's trying to waken the dead by making all this noise. And you might still hear mothers say to children in Ireland, if a child makes a lot of noise a mother shouts, you're going to waken the dead by making all this noise. The joviality of the wake house is replaced by a sense of gravity with the loss of so many of our ancestors during the great famine of the 1840s. The famine village at Doe uniquely tells their story. From 1841 to 1851, the population of Ireland fell from 6 million to 4 million. Before the famine, over-dependence grew on one crop, the potato. It is not difficult to understand the devastation in Ireland when blight, a fungal infestation, wiped out the potato crop in 1845. The famine village recreates 19th century rural Ireland with a stunning display. One of the reasons people were so poor was that they did not own their own land. The landlord's house, with its fine architecture, was isolated from the masses. Now this scene here explains about landlords in Ireland. And the problem with landlords was they lived a very high lifestyle and they kept competing against one another. So just imagine the landlord down the road builds a big house. The one further up the road felt he had to do the same. And yet how he funded it, just like us in Ireland today, he borrowed all this money. And how he intended to pay back the money he borrowed. He kept dividing his estate into smaller portions every year and rented it out to all these farmers. They paid him rent and he paid off his debt. And first there came a recession and then came the famine. So the farmers stopped paying the rents. The landlord couldn't pay off all the debt he created. And just like us in Ireland these days, landlords, they went bankrupt. So in 1849, the British government introduced a new act as called the Encumbered Estates Act. This act means that the government had the right to go on, take over all the bankrupt estates of Ireland and sell them off at very cheap prices. New landlords arrived in Ireland, didn't know the people, didn't care for the people, and they started to clear all the people off the land. A fascinating new addition to the village is a display that deals with the recent history of the Troubles in Northern Ireland. The Republican Safe House was opened in 2007 by the former Taoiseach, Albert Reynolds. During the Troubles, safe houses were used by those trying to escape from the authorities. To the uninformed, it looked like an ordinary house. But for those in the know, 
hidden doorways led to places of sanctuary. The Famine Village also explores the historical diversity in this part of Ireland with its display of an orange hall and artefacts of a vibrant Protestant culture. For the culturally curious visitor, the Famine Village presents a unique and engaging vision of Irish history. Pat Doherty's dream of creating a cultural space based on his and his community's experiences in Donegal has been a remarkable success and it continues to connect with visitors from far and wide.